there, it's Christine from Nurse and Making, and today we're gonna talk about vital signs. We're gonna look at how to obtain a pulse, an oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, blood pressure, temperature, and pain. First off, we have the patient's pulse, or their heart rate. This is the number of times your heart beats per minute, which is why you'll see it written as beats per minute. An expected heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, less than 60 beats per minute is considered bradycardia, and anything greater than 100 beats per minute is considered tachycardia. Something to note is that athletes tend to have a lower heart rate, so it may be normal for an athlete to have a resting heart rate in the 40s or the 50s. Now let's look at some tips for assessing a pulse. You do not wanna use your thumb when palpating a pulse. Your thumb actually has its own pulse that you may mistake as your patient's. Be sure to determine the rate and the strength of the pulse. We assess the strength on a pulse scale, rating it from zero to four plus. If the patient has a regular pulse and no cardiac issues are present, you can count for 30 seconds and multiply that number by two. And the last tip is to use a Doppler device if you're having trouble finding a pulse. Now a Doppler device can be used if you're trying to assess a weak pulse or you can't find the pulse. A little pro tip is if a pulse is found using a Doppler, mark the location with a skin safe marker so you or someone else can easily find it next time. First off, let's assess the radial pulse. This is the most common site for assessing a pulse. This is the main artery on the wrist found on the right side of the thumb. You wanna place your first and second fingers at the base of the patient's thumb. You can count for a full minute, or like I said before, if the patient has no cardiac history, you can count for 30 seconds and multiply by two. Okay, next we have the apical pulse. This can only be assessed with a stethoscope. The apical pulse is located at the fifth intercostal space at the left midclavicular line. You always, always wanna count the apical pulse for a full minute, whether the patient has a cardiac issue or they don't. Okay, next we have the carotid pulse. This is found on the grooves of the anterior sides of the neck, just below the angle of the jaw. This is between the trachea and the muscles on the side of the neck. You wanna use your first and second finger to palpate the carotid pulse on either sides of the neck. Now, do not palpate both sides simultaneously. Palpating both sides simultaneously can cause decreased blood flow to the brain. Now let's look at the respiratory rate. This is the number of breaths taken per minute. You'll see it written as breaths per minute. Now, something to note, chest rise plus chest fall counts as one respiration. So, one, two. An expected respiratory rate for an adult is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Now, less than 12 breaths per minute is considered bradypnea and greater than 20 breaths per minute is considered tachypnea. Some tips for assessing the respiratory rate is to obtain the respiratory rate and the pulse oximetry at the same time. When a patient knows you're taking their respiratory rate, it may alter their breathing and skew the data. So remember, take the respiratory rate while you're taking the pulse ox. And be sure the patient has been comfortable in a bed or a chair for at least five to 10 minutes. Next, let's look at oxygen saturation. This is the percentage of oxygen-bound hemoglobin in the blood. This is measured using a pulse ox. Now, an expected oxygen saturation is anywhere between 95 and 100%. If this falls below 95%, it's considered hypoxemia. But it's important you know that COPD patients may have a baseline oxygen saturation level as low as 88 to 92%. This is the expected or normal for COPD patients. Things that can affect the pulse ox reading. Artificial or gel nails, cold hands, and poor circulation can definitely affect the oxygen reading. Okay, next is blood pressure. This is the pressure of circulating blood against the walls of the blood vessels. Blood pressure is measured in units of millimeters of mercury, written as MMHG. This is the American Heart Association's blood pressure chart. This is how you can interpret what the readings mean. Now for the steps to obtain a manual blood pressure. First, you wanna make sure the patient's arm is at heart level and their legs are uncrossed. Next, you wanna choose the appropriate size cuff. 
If it's too small or tight, you'll get a false high reading. And if it's too large or loose, you'll get a false low reading. You can remember this by the memory trick, too loose, think false low. Then you'll snugly place the blood pressure cup on the upper arm directly on the skin. You don't wanna place it over clothing. Two fingers should fit under the cuff, but it will be very snug. You want to locate the brachial artery and line up the brachial artery with the index marker on the cuff. Be sure the meter gauge is in full view on the side of the cuff. Then place the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the brachial artery. Then you'll inflate the cuff 30 millimeters of mercury above the patient's normal systolic. Then you will slowly deflate the cuff and listen for a sound almost like a loud pulse. The first sound you hear is the top number or the systolic pressure. And the last clear sound you hear is the diastolic pressure. After you hear the last sound, you can completely deflate the cuff and remove it from the patient's arm. Next we have temperature. This indicates how well your body can make and get rid of heat. This is the measurement of the body's internal heat level, crucial for assessing metabolic activity and overall health status. Temperature is measured using a thermometer. A normal temperature is 97.8 to 99 Fahrenheit and 36.5 to 37.2 Celsius. If the temperature falls below 95 degrees Fahrenheit or less than 35 degrees Celsius, this is considered hypothermia. A temperature over 104 degrees Fahrenheit or over 40 degrees Celsius is considered hyperthermia. Temperature can be measured in many different ways. Orally, axillary or under the armpit, tympanically or in the ear, temporally or on the forehead, and rectally or placed in the rectum, which is the most commonly used in infants and newborns. Taking the temperature rectally is the most accurate reading. And lastly, we have pain. Yep, pain is considered a vital sign. It's subjective data given to you by the patient. Subjective think what the patient says. Pain can be measured in many different ways. Most commonly, it's measured by the zero to 10 numeric rating scale on an alert and oriented patient. You've probably been asked at some point in your life, what's your pain level on a scale from zero to 10? But for smaller children or those who do not speak the language at your hospital, you can use the Wong Baker Faces Scale. This allows a child or patient to point to a face which identifies their pain level. If you're a nursing student, new grad nurse, or a seasoned nurse, you'll definitely find the clinical pocket guide very helpful. This pocket guide contains over 300 pages of the most common information you need to know on the floor. Happy studying, future nurses.